Hello and welcome to Aliens Revealed Live. I'm your host, Dean Caparilla, here on the Paranormal UK Radio Network. From alien abductions to monster-infested ranches to men in black, near-death experiences, close encounter experiences and more, we speak to some of the most amazing people on the planet, ready and willing to share their chilling stories with you. And they all come from the Aliens Revealed Live files here on the Paranormal UK Radio Network. Well, the UFO phenomenon has ramped up during the past decade. In fact, it's almost safe to say that UFO sightings today don't have the same stigma as they once did. It wasn't too long ago when reporting a UFO came with certain ridicule. You just kept it to yourself. But that has really changed in the past couple of decades, so much so that just hearing of a UFO sighting is almost like, meh. So what are the reasons a UFO sighting today is almost considered normal? There are several reasons, but no doubt the advent of the internet has played a huge part. It's been a huge weapon for ufologists and UFO devotees alike in spreading the word. Once upon a time, if someone reported seeing an unidentified flying object, the only way to broadcast it would be through news programs or newspapers. The avenues open to reporting UAPs was limited. Plus, many people would have been reluctant to even mention what they saw unless other witnesses came forward. Now, people are capturing the UFO phenomenon on their smartphones and devices, and within minutes, it's posted online. Just take a look at the number of UFO groups now on Facebook. They are endless, and many members make it their mission to be the eyes and ears of their respective groups. Unidentified aerial phenomenon captured by these UFO sleuths is posted online and shared countless times by other members. Just join and scroll through the posts on these groups online and feel the passion behind their comments. It's quite remarkable. International UFO researcher and author Philip Mantle says the emergence of well-credentialed researchers plus the advent of shows such as The X-Files has helped bring the topic into people's living rooms. But has there been an increase in UFO activity? I'm not so sure, but there certainly has been a massive jump in UFO reports. And Philip Mantle's joining the program right now. Hi, Philip. Uh, good afternoon, Dean. Nice to speak to you. Pleasure to have you with us today. Um, I note that your first interest or research began way back in 1979, so that's a long time uh, in, this, uh, in this business. And I've always got admiration uh, for people that uh, are in uh, researching ufology that uh, dedicate their lives to it. So what was your interest in the UFO topic? Yeah, I mean, ever since I was a young lad, Dean, I was always interested in um, all things paranormal, if you like. And um, for example, when I was about 14 years of age, um, my best friend's grandmother used to live right opposite where we did. So I used to go to the spiritualist church with her. And whilst I found it interesting, it, it, you know, I, I wanted to know more. And of course, in those days, to learn anything, the, the pretty much your only uh, way of doing so was to read. No internet, of course, in those days. So I was, I was an avid reader. And uh, I started reading a little bit about the UFO subject, and it intrigued me. And then, of course, um, the Spielberg blockbuster Close Encounters came out. Uh, I didn't realize how much of an effect that movie had, but it certainly did. And um, in, in early 1979, I went to work in Germany for a short while. And again, not speaking the language, on an evening you either, you know, went down the local restaurant or the bar or you, you would read. You know, I could sit and watch the television, but I couldn't understand a word of it. So my mother sent me a few books, and some of those were on UFOs. So when I got back home in, in, uh, in, in 1979, uh, my aunt, who lived around the corner, brought me a, 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 an evening newspaper. Uh, it's called the Yorkshire Post, printed and published in Leeds. And uh, there was a small advert in it for uh, a meeting that coming Sunday with the Yorkshire UFO Society. So I thought, well, that sounds interesting. So back in 1979, of course, in, in the UK on a Sunday, everything was closed, <laughs> you know, I mean, completely. So I got a bus, 
I didn't drive at the time. I found the location uh, in Leeds where this meeting was taking place. And off I went. Uh, and the meeting was uh, hosted by two brothers, Mark and Graham Birdsell. And they had just formed the Yorkshire UFO Society. And uh, they put on a presentation. And um, from that day on, Dean, I was hooked, you know, uh, quite literally. Uh, Graham and Mark went on uh, many years later to publish UFO magazine that sold in, in large numbers around the world. It was a new stand publication. But uh, I was always the type of young man that wanted to know more, Dean. You know, I'm the kind of guy, if there's a button that says don't push, I want to know what happens if he did push it. And we were just fortunate that Graham and Mark had been involved already for a few years. And areas in and around uh, North Yorkshire, where in the Yorkshire Dales National Park around the market town of Skipton, had a lot of UFO sightings. And uh, they somehow found their way to us at the Yorkshire UFO Society. So I just felt I was lucky. There were sightings coming in that we could investigate in an area that wasn't too far from us. It was just over an hour's drive, you know. And um, so, and you know, I jumped in with both feet. Uh, and at the last conference, sadly Graham's no longer with us. Um, uh, the last conference he, he, he ever did was a very large one in Leeds. And I was uh, doing a presentation there. And, and he reminded us, did Graham, of how we began, you know, literally from the ground upwards. And uh, so that's that's how it all began, Dean, you know, okay. quite by chance, really. So in your research over the years, have you noticed a big difference in the way UFOs are investigated today as opposed to back when you started? I mean, absolutely. I mean, in my day, uh, you, you would do as much as you could face-to-face. Uh, -face. You know, that would mean travelling, in you know, wherever possible and interviewing the witnesses face-to-face, -face, going to the locations where these incidents and all sightings happened uh, and so on. Uh, if things were a bit further away, we literally had a UFO sighting report form, like a questionnaire, if you like, that you would send to people and have them complete. Or you would write to them or phone them, you know. And, and it, it was a lot... Uh, I don't know if it was any better, but it certainly took a lot longer you to certainly think about it. And when you were part of an organization like that, um, you had sightings of all different kinds come your way, Dean. You know, from the lights in the sky to things seen on the ground, photographs, sometimes a bit of film. Um, so, you know, you really had to be a, a, a jack of all trades uh, to be involved correctly, you know. So some people went on to concentrate on a particular type of sighting or encounter but you know I've, I've just dealt with what's ever ever come my way you know so things were certainly a lot slower in those days and, and it seems like it's ramped up uh, a few levels now because it seems back in those days it was more about sightings than actual alien contact well, yeah I mean there the, the was I think the stigma that's attached to we'll call them close encounters for want of a better phrase, um, has diminished down the decades from when I first started. Um, you know, to get people to even be interviewed in private about uh, an encounter was uh, never that easy, uh, simply because of this stigma, which the stigma was largely because of the way the media treated the subject. And then, of course, things began to change slowly but surely, you know, when we had people like Dr. John Mack, Harvard professor, become involved. Uh, here in the UK, we had Nick Pope from the Ministry of Defence become involved. It gave the subject an air of credibility. And, and that goes up and down as, as time passes, you know, as peaks and troughs. But, uh, I, you know, I don't think the TV series, for example, The X-Files, did any great harm. It brought the subject into everybody's living room. Uh, and even now, most people will know the, the word Roswell. And all they'll know is that's where the spaceship crashed. You know, they won't necessarily know a lot more about it. But back when I first started, 
you know, Roswell was, wasn't even mentioned anywhere. I mean, you know, it's as simple as that. It had yet to be reborn, so to speak. So, um, you know, the, the stigma is, is still there, but I don't think it's as great as it used to be. Therefore, when there's serious reporting of the subject, people who have had these encounters uh, do tend to, to relax somewhat and, and are able to speak about it. Yeah, I think the uh, X-Files uh, impact uh, in the 90s, I think, was significant because it kind of um, it kind of was the catalyst for more investigation and research into, uh, into the cover-up of, of uh, UFOs and, and, and the alien topic. Yeah, I mean, and the writers of that kept a close tab on what was happening in, in the real world of UFO research, and you would see that theme flow through some of their episodes. Uh, for example, I was involved with the Alien Autopsy film, and the X Files did their own episode about the Alien Autopsy, their own version of it. So they did keep a close tabs on what was happening in the real world as well, and of course, it brought it into everybody's living room. Yeah. And um, you know, you, you, that's fair enough. So, to any budding UFO researchers watching today, um, what would be your advice about uh, researching this topic? It, because it, it, it's probably not one where you'd want to go in with a uh, with a made up mind of, of what you believe is real. There really needs to be investigation done because you need you need to, to, to check all the facts. Yeah, I mean, I think it's fair to say now that even from a sceptical viewpoint. Uh, we can say that these encounters do indeed take place. Um, it's, 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 not, it's not a question anymore of whether UFOs are real or not. I think we can, if, you, you know, if we were to take the UFO phenomenon to court, we could win the argument. The argument then goes on to say, well, okay, now what lies behind the UFO phenomenon? What is its nature and origin? which is something entirely different. It's like saying, you know, there's my car parked on the drive. Okay, we agree it's a car, but who built it? You know, where was it manufactured? You know, so, and that's where you have to try and keep an open mind. It's very, very difficult, Dean, and I can understand why some people have preconceived ideas or theories. I certainly did when I started. I was very naive, didn't know an awful lot, my own opinions have changed as the years have progressed, you know, and I dare say they'll change again, you know. I was reading a quote today, and I've heard it before, but, you know, it's, your mind is like a parachute. It works best when it's open, you know, and, and, and I'll leave it at that. Yeah. Were, were, were you ever afraid as a researcher that uh, you may – um, find out too much. You may step on somebody's toes or a, uh, or an organisation's toes, and it, it may come back to haunt you. No, no, never, never, never had any feelings like that whatsoever. I mean, when we tried our damnedest, areas in and around Skipton, in in the Yorkshire Dales, had a, you know, uh, they were haunted by UFO sightings and other paranormal phenomena. And we did our best to try and confront the phenomena face to face. You know, we camped out upon the moors in the rain and the mist when it was supposed to be the summer, you know. And um, so I was never worried about, you know, treading on anyone's toes from a, a, an official viewpoint, so to speak. I mean, you know, we used to pester the, the Ministry of Defence for information and RAF stations, and play, you know, you name it. If we were looking for information, we would contact them. Um, so it never bothered me what, whatsoever. Yeah, yeah. You just uh, you kind of always wonder whether that uh, that dark suburban would pull up in you know in front of your place, and a couple of guys in dark suits would get out and and knock on the door. No, nope, never had any of that. And of course, I would welcome that because if it did happen, then I'd think, well, I'm doing something right, you know. I'm, I mean, I must be doing something right, so I, w I would welcome it. But no, I mean, ne never, never anything like that at all. We've had some really publicised uh, UFO, UFO events over the years, Roswell to Travis Walton to the Pascagoula event, and they have been very, very well publicised and documented. But I always wondered, were the bigger UFO incidents that happened um, that haven't been as well publicised in, in, in your research? Did you think there were... There were uh, there were bigger events? 
I, mean, I wouldn't say bigger events, but there's always other events uh, when you've been involved as long as I have that you're perhaps having your filing cabinet or wh however you store your data that have never made the headlines uh, for whatever reason, you know. Um, I mean, again, it, it, I, I haven't been involved that long when Mark Birdsell and myself uh, investigated a landing case in broad daylight. Um, not that far from where I live now. And it involved a, a mother and, and five of her children. And um, she was amazed it never made the news because she assumed that they'd seen it. So therefore, lots of other people must have seen it that day. They lived in a housing estate near a busy motorway. And she was more puzzled, I think, by the fact that nobody else reported anything, you know. And it was a fascinating encounter. And that's just one that springs to mind. This never made the headlines. I mean, I've written a few articles about it and things like that. But, uh, you know, I, I'll give you another example. Sadly, Stanton Friedman passed away this year. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, a chap by the name of Grant Cameron has been looking through Stanton's files. It's probably the biggest collection of UFO files ever owned by a single person. Uh, and they're coming across a whole host of things that, we never knew about, you know, simply because you can't write, you know, something like Stanton cannot simply publicize everything that comes his way, you know. Yeah. Similarly, um, the late Bud Hopkins, um, you know, abduction researcher in New York, published a number of books. I was on friendly terms with Bud. Now, his archive is owned by Dr. David Jacobs, who, who in turn is working with a documentary maker who has access to the archives. And he said, Philip, I, you know, I've spoken to this documentary, and I said, I could be here for years. Yeah, you know, yeah. there is just so much. So for whatever reason, there are certain cases, quite rightly, that do catch the media's attention and gain, you know, widespread publicity, and others, for other reasons, that, that don't, you know. Yeah. Have, you got, uh, have you got a couple of favourites that you've researched uh, since you started? Well, that one I mentioned, I mean, uh, it's a place called Normanton. It's a, a former mining town. Uh, I come from a small mining village myself. My father worked down the mines all his life. So the people involved uh, were the kind of people I'd grown up with. The children even played a ball game. It's a made-up ball game. It's the same ball game I played as a, as a, as a, as a child. So they lived in a cul-de-sac. At the end of the cul-de-sac were some, uh, some fields and some trees and some electricity pylons. And just after lunch, and their houses were a row of terraced houses, but they were elevated. So the ball goes up in the air, and the children, in a, a lovely summer's day, see this object descend at an angle, stop, and then drop to the ground. They run inside. Uh, a lady by the name of Mrs. Westman was washing the dishes just after lunch. And they said, you know, Mom, there's, there's something crashed in the fields. So she came out and she, she could, because the, the front door was elevated, she could see across these fields. And when she phoned me, she said, Philip, you'll, you'll never believe me. You'll never believe me. You'll, you know, you'll never believe me. And she said it looked like a Mexican hat shape, but was like a silver color. So she got the children, they walked across these fields. The, 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 they lost sight of it because you go down a little dip. And then when you reach the other side, the, the field was bordered by a fence. And in this field sat this Mexican hat-shaped silver-gray thing. But now there was three tall humanoids who had something in their hand and seemed to be waving it across the ground. Um, they described them as having been in a one-piece white suit with a visor, not gloves, but mittens. And the children wanted to climb the fence and go in there, but... The mum stopped them. These three humanoids walked to the rear of this, and off it went and gone, you know, whence it had came. Um, we also interviewed one of the, 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 the children's friends. He'd actually gone home for lunch. He'd been playing with them, and then he'd come back after lunch, and he, he was miffed that he'd missed all the excitement. And, um, and it's fascinating because it is in a very built-up area, there's the M62 motorway, which is the, the main motorway that goes from the east coast across to the west, from Hull to Manchester. Extremely busy, right next door to it. 
Mrs. Westerman thought this will be on the TV news tonight. You know, surely others will have seen it. Not a thing. Nothing in the local newspapers. Nothing. Uh, and, and that bothered her. You know, that really did bother her. And um, so it's one of those cases I have in my files that always sticks in my mind, Dean. You know, these people, I know it's not scientific, but they're either telling the truth or they were lying. There's no misidentification here. No. And I can find no reason why they would tell a lie. You know, it's as simple as that. You've been involved with a couple of books now produced by uh, Calvin Parker, of course, involved with the Pascal Gula incident. What, what attracted you to Calvin's uh, case? Well, I first read about the Pascal Gula um, encounter that took place on October the 11th, 1973. Pascal Gula's in Mississippi. Uh, and I did. I read about it in in the in the early 1980s. I think in a magazine, and I, I just found it fascinating because it was a bizarre encounter that happened. And not only that, it was what happened afterwards. The two men involved were well, Charlie Hickson, who was 42, Calvin was 18, almost 19 at the time. Calvin had only been living in the area, you know, for a, for a couple of weeks. His first day at work. And they went and informed the, the local sheriff. Sheriff interviewed them, didn't really believe them. Then he put the sheriff put them both together in a room and, and did a secret recording. He thought, we'll find out now. Of course, the secret tape, as it became to be known, didn't have them admitting anything. They were still terrified by what's happening. They were taken the next day to the hospital to be examined, then to the Air Force base to be checked for, for radiation. And then, lo and behold, Dr. Alan Hynek uh, flies down, along with Dr. James Harder. And before Hynek left, he, he said, you know, these, these two gentlemen had a very real experience. So all that kind of fascinated me. I mean, you know, I think, in my opinion, I still hold Dr. Hynek in, in, you know, in, in very high esteem. And um, what I found out is that this was Hynek's favorite case down the years. And, and both Charlie and Calvin did keep in touch with him on occasion. And um, it's just a fascinating incident that, you know, there's lots of other things we've learned since then, of course, but it was just, it just, it just, it was just like, unlike anything I'd ever read about. Yeah. We'll be, we'll be talking with Calvin Parker too later today. Uh, another book you wrote, Once Upon a Missing Time, a um, little bit of fact, a little bit of fiction. Yeah, I mean, it's a novel, play on words, obviously there with, you know, Once Upon a Missing Time. In, in 1994, I co-authored my first book, which was called Without Consent. And this was all about uh, abduction and missing time reports in the UK. That came about quite by accident. Um, my co-author is a chap called Carl Negatis. Carl was a, a, a Fleet Street uh, journalist. And Carl and I had been... Um, asked to work on a, a documentary and uh, we did all the research for it and then the you know the, the production company pulled the plug so we we've been left with all this research so I just, you know I said well, why don't we turn it into a book so we did and that was without consent and um, you know I traveled the length and breadth literally of, of the UK interviewing people he said at the beginning you know how did you do your research but in those days, I literally had a kit bag with my tape recorder, notebook, camera, and a few other odds and ends that would go in the back of the car. And I'd tell my wife, I'll, I'll be home whenever you see me, you know. <laughs> no mobile phones those days, Dean. So, I, you know, I had all this information. You know, not everything went into without consent. And um, it stayed with me. It was all rattling around in my head. So just to... to uh, you know, see if I could do it. I wrote a novel and it was based on the, some of the encounters that I, I'd spoken to people about. So it is a work of fiction, but there are parts in there. If you, if you read my, my previous book without consent, you'll say, I can see where he got that bit from now, you know, see where that, that, that's. so all the people in it, for example, are real characters. I've just changed their names and occupations and so on. And, um, so I just thought, you know, maybe it'd be nice. I had no intention of publishing it, Dean. It's, it's, it's sat 
gathering dust for, for many, many years. I, I did a, a printout of it. And I think, you know, I think there was three copies in existence of that printout. And uh, when I set up Flying Disc Press, you know, one of the things we did is, is republish it. It had already been published by a, a publisher. So uh, I thought, well, why not? It's, it's another avenue of exposing the UFO phenomenon to, to, to those that are interested. I think it's got. Uh, I think it's a great concept and also um, a great base for a, for a television series. Well, you know, I've I've, I've got interest in a in a possible movie f- based on it. Uh, um, it's unlikely that will happen, but you know, I've, I've I've always said, and this is no disrespect to anyone, on, on the the movies that have been made about encounters are normally set in America. You know, so my my idea with both the factual book, the non-fiction book, Without Consent, Without Consent only deals with encounters in the UK, nowhere else. And my idea was to show that these encounters do happen anywhere in the world, including here in the UK. And they're not always out in the desert of Roswell, New Mexico, or, you know, you're an Aussie, you know, you've got one of the biggest countries in the world. Nobody lives there. You know, you can quite easily get lost in the outback. Yeah, yeah. But some of these incidents, you know, happened whilst people were driving home from work here in the UK or going to see their girlfriend or picking wild flowers in the, in the field behind their house, you know. And um, so I wanted to emphasize that these encounters, whatever they may be, can happen to anywhere to anyone. So we did that in the non-fiction book, and I tried to emphasize it a little bit more uh, in Once Upon a Missing Time, and then showing Once Upon a Missing Time how such encounters can affect the individuals in, you know, in person. Uh, yeah. For example, who do you tell? If you have one of these encounters, who do you tell? Can't, there's no Ghostbusters. There's going to carry Ghostbusters, you know? So what we have in, in Once Upon a Missing Time is, is a, a, you know, a, a married couple and their children. That's their encounter. So who, who they tell, you know? And it usually goes something like this. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll tell my partner or my family. They don't know what to do. I must be going mad, so I'll, I'll maybe speak to my family doctor. He prescribes some, some medication. Well, that's no good. So it usually ends up with the UFO researcher as a last resort. Yeah. And and I see that I saw my role when in, in, in investigating these cases as o- almost like a, an untrained counsellor. You 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 know you would sit there and listen, and that's a, a lot of the time people were grateful that you would sit down and take them seriously and listen to what they had to say. You know, yeah. yeah. So I emphasised that uh, you know in the in the novel. Yep. Well, you mentioned the. Um the USA seems to hog most of the UFO uh, limelight with the incidents that happened here, but you've written a couple of books about the, some, some famous UFO incidents, um, Mysterious Sky, uh, and then there's one on, uh, on USOs, about Russian USOs, and you seem to have a fascination for, for the UFO topic in Russia. Yes. I mean, again, in the, in the late uh, 1980s, there was an incident at a place called Voronezh in Russia. And this was a UFO landing. Uh, the information was actually released by the Soviet Union's official news agency, TASS. And when contacted by the Western media, they asked TASS if this was some kind of joke. And TASS said, we don't joke. You know, this was the official Soviet uh, news agency. So I was contacted by a Russian newspaper called Izvestia, and they asked me my thoughts on it. And I only knew what I'd, what I'd read, so I, I gave him some. I can't even remember what I said. A few general quotes. To my amazement, they published what I had to say in their newspaper, and they even sent me a copy. And I could only read my name, of course. And then, out of the blue, I started getting letters from Russia. And all it, I used to live in a small town called Batley. So all it said on the, on the letter was, Philip Mantle, UFOs, Batley, England. And somehow they arrived. 
Uh, and then I, kept, I got books and things like this. Now, most of this was in Russian. Uh, one or two were, were in English. I couldn't speak a word of it. There was no Google Translate or anything like that. But I knew of my colleague, Paul Stonehill, in the States. Paul was originally from the Ukraine and managed to escape the Soviet regime when he was a teenager um, and now lives in, in California. So I contacted Paul, and uh, this material started to grow. I mean, more and more came to me, so I eventually shipped it all to Paul. And that's how we became interested, Dean. We managed to, uh, between us, keep up a line of communication, even though there was, it was still the Soviet Union at, at that time. And of course, since the fall of the Berlin Wall and, 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 and uh, the, the Soviet Union and, and the internet, birth of the internet and so on, our, our, our contacts there have grown down the years. Now, for example, in 1995, one of the other things I used to do, I was a conference organizer. And one of the conferences I organized in Sheffield uh, saw for the first and last time, as far as I'm aware, the only two Russian scientists ever to lecture at a UFO conference in the UK. That was Dr. Sergei Chernow and Dr. Yuli Platov, both of the Academy of Sciences in Russia. Uh, they actually studied the ionosphere uh, as, 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 as a profession. So that, that's how far our, our, our you know, progress in, into things, all things Russian. And it still goes. We still have information that comes our way, you know, uh, from our, our, our colleagues there. And again, it was another way of showing um, the doubters, uh, whoever they may be, that the UFO phenomena does not recognize any international boundaries, Dean. You know, it's as simple as that. You know, Russia is the, you know, the biggest country in the world, and it has its own fair share of, of UFO sightings and, and encounters, yeah, some of which we've touched upon in, the, in, the, in, our, in our work. It's not prejudiced at all, is it? Not at all. Um, did you ever run across any cases that um, that featured malevolent um, ETs, bad ETs? No, I haven't. No, I, I mean, this, this is a puzzling aspect. One of the things, I mentioned Dr. David Jacobs, well-known abduction researcher. He, he does think that they are, they are malevolent. But then you had his, his colleague and friend, Bud Hopkins. So, well, I never came across that, you know? So... How that pans out, I'm, I'm not entirely sure. When it also comes to the individuals, this is the way I, I look at it, Dean, rather from my point of view. Uh, if you speak to the individuals, how did you think this was? You know, How did you evaluate the encounter? Was this something bad that happened to you? And, and again, you get a mixture of opinions, because that's all there is at the end of the day. It is an opinion. And I mean, there's one lady who lived in, 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 in the Midlands here in the UK. Um, she thought it was a very positive thing for her because a lot of positive things happened uh, after the encounter, which ha you know, hadn't even been in the melting pot beforehand. Yeah. And so, you know, it, it's down to, a, a, I think, a personal viewpoint of, of how you look upon these experiences. All of the people I, I, I've interviewed have, have, have been affected in some way, one way or another, some positive, some negative. So whether you would call that malevolent or not, I think that's, that's you know, that's still up for debate, I think. We've spoken to uh, several courageous people over the last uh, few days um, from the CE5 Experiencer uh, group. And, um, I mean, it's pretty hard to wrap your head around, but have, have you done any research on that topic, CE5, Close Encounter 5? <coughs> I mean, I've, I've, down the years, I've not, I've not concentrated on any one area of, of research, Dean. And I think it would be fair to say that I've, I've, been, I've, you know, I've researched just about anything and everything <laughs> at some point. I mean, there's, there's a lady I've been in touch with here uh, on and off for years. Um, and, you know, I don't bother her. She, she, she knows where I am. And she'll tell me of her. They seem more like a... I don't, I don't mean this word in any way, but more of a, a spiritual encounter with the ETs, you know? And it's not 
she finds it very difficult to explain it herself, but it's almost as if it's not nuts and bolts. There's something other than that, not, not paranormal, but spiritual, uh, you know, when she's not sure herself. And, um, you know, these encounters, plural, have been happening to her for many, many years. And, and at first it, it, it did scare her, but she's now come to the conclusion, well, I've never been hurt. I've never had any physical, uh, you know, after effects. Therefore, why should I be scared? It's like being scared of the dark. The dark's not going to hurt me, you know? Yeah. So, um, again, it, yeah. it's, it's an interesting aspect. It seems um, the C5 experiences are, are really coming out in force now and coming out and telling their story, which to me seems to be leading into the topic of disclosure. I mean, it's, there must be some sort of a connection there. Well, yeah, I mean, we, we started uh, uh, talking at the beginning about the, the stigma. And I think, again, certainly this last two years, for example, when you had the um, revelations in the New York Times that the U.S. Department of Defense had been secretly studying UFOs, they put X amount of millions of dollars into it, and uh, people involved in that have now stepped forward uh, the U.S. senators behind the project have also come out of the woodwork. Now, these people have probably got more to lose than they have to gain by by going on the record, but nonetheless, they have. So in turn, I think it, it creates uh, an atmosphere whereby <clears throat> encounter experiences feel uh, safer, if you, for want of a better word, you know, to come forward. You know, maybe the, the time is, is now right. Like I've said, from a uh, you, uh, we'll, we'll take Calvin Parker for example you're speaking to Calvin later on so I won't go into any great details but in, back in the 1970s the arch skeptic of the time was the late Philip Class. now I have Philip Class's whole file on the Pascagoula case and he just completely labelled it a hoax you know that these guys were lying okay he'd no evidence to support that but now you bring it up to date, you have the skeptics uh, society or organization or whatever they're called. And I read another article by a chap called Joe Nickel, who's part of the same skeptical group. And again, it dealt with Pascagoula, but he doesn't now dismiss it as a hoax. He now says he thinks it was some kind of psychological experience. So even the skeptics have changed. They are now saying, no, they're not hoaxes. They're not telling. They're not, not a bunch of liars. There's a psychological phenomenon at work here. So they even they are admitted, <coughs> excuse me, that these experiences are in inverted commas real. You right. know, they do take place. It's just we disagree with their version of, of, of reality. Right. So, so that that for me has been a big shift. You know, and I've seen that happen in my lifetime yeah. and, and during my involvement. Have you ever thought about what the world would look like post-disclosure? I didn't quite hear that. You just broke up, Dean. Sorry. No, I just said, have you ever thought about what the world would look like post-disclosure? Yeah, I mean, look, look, the thing about disclosure, I, I, you know, I've discussed it with colleagues on and off down the decades. First and foremost, who would you have deliver disclosure? Would you believe the U.S. president? Would you believe the Secretary General of the United Nations? Would you believe it if the Pope said it, you know? So in the current climate, would you believe it if Donald Trump told you? Oh. I don't know. So we also add to the fact that there are great proportions of mankind uh, still alive today and we're not linked to the internet who have no access so whichever whichever body or person you had announced it there would still be a large proportion who would not believe it you know for example there's a big proportion of don't believe we landed on the moon despite all the evidence and then you would have another portion of humanity wouldn't even hear about it in the first place well, I've said, okay, let, let's assume we can pick on a, an, an organization that we would choose to deliver the message. Would it really change your life that much, Dean? 
tomorrow, <laughs> tomorrow I still have to pay my electricity bill. You know, I still have to take the dog for a walk. It's still going to rain. So perhaps on a, a certain level, it wouldn't really change an awful lot. You know? I guess, I guess the things that will change, um, I mean, I'm, I'm tipping where we're going to be told about uh, certain kinds of technology that are just going to make um, things like, um, like um, combustion engines and, and oil defunct. I think, I think things like uh, poverty and, and starvation, um, those issues would just about um, be gone. But I think the biggest um, change from my perspective is the um is the belief system of uh, all the religions around the world well i mean i i remember discussing this with my local vicar many years ago and he just shrugged his shoulders and as far as he's concerned if there are aliens out there then his god made them same as us you know just because it doesn't mention them in the bible is no big deal you know he says you know god says there are many many rooms in my mansion you know uh, so I, I don't think it would be such a big deal um, what did make me think is I, I published a book this year, and sadly, it's one of those that I think everyone should read, but, but I know it's called Hyper Civilizations, and it's by Dr. Dan Farkas. Now, Dan's a PhD from Romania, so he's, he's not Stephen Hawking or any well-known, you know, Western scientist. What Dan speculates, I wrote, I published his first book, which was UFOs, over Romania. So that was all UFO encounters. And at the end, he gave a brief explanation of what he thought laid behind them. What, what Dan's theory is, is that, yes, we are being visited by beings from another world, we'll say, but they are so far advanced mm -hmm. in that no matter what we do or how much money we, we pump into the subject, how, how many scientists we could get you know, to work on such a project, we would never be able to understand it. He said, it's like you get a flat screen television and stick it in an ant's nest. The ants would crawl all over it and be aware that something is there and they could touch it and smell it and sting it or whatever it is they do. But never in a million years would they be able to understand what it is. Yeah. You know, so... I don't think it would change our, our way, uh, you know, our worldview that much. I don't think it would give us cures for cancer or, you know, anything else or technology because it is simply beyond us, not beyond us as individuals, yeah. <clears throat> but beyond us as a species, you know? Well, it's good, good, good to get different pers perspectives on that question. I've asked um, a lot of people so far and uh, uh, we seem to get a whole variety of, of, of thoughts, but, we're almost out of time, Philip, but I just wanted to ask you, do you have anything on the drawing board, uh, book, or even film-wise? Well, yeah. I mean, there's always something going on. I mean, um, one of the things I was involved in is the Alien Autopsy film hoax. So I'm, re I'm, I'm revamping my own book on that. You'll see that shortly. Uh, and I've taken part in a, a documentary series uh, based on it as well. We're working with Calvin Parker. Um, we're hoping that Calvin's encounter will be made into a movie. Calvin will tell you more about that when you speak to him. I've got a whole raft of books in the pipeline to be published next year um, on a, a whole host of topics, one of which is by a lady called Diane Tessman from the States. She speculates that the, the, the people behind the UFOs are not ETs, they're actually us from the future. So it's mankind coming back in time. So that's a different topic on it. We're having, you know, some uh, real-life experiences as well, writing their own books. Uh, a pair of twin brothers, Philip and, and Ronald Kinsella, both different books, you know, not together. So there's a, and there's a lot more to come, you know, uh, and I carry on with my research as and when it, it, it drops in my inbox, Dean. Yep, yep. And where, where can people follow your work? Just, just go to – they can find me on – I'm on Facebook – you know, or they can just find me at Flying Disc Press, you know, uh, uh, that's my blog, everything is on there, and there's a way of contacting me on there as well. I'm easy to find, Dean, I don't hide away, you know. Well, it's, uh, it's been an absolute pleasure speaking with you, and uh, we hope uh, we can talk with you again in the near future, and, uh, and good luck with your future projects. 
Thank you, Dean. And, I, I, you know, I'll speak to you any time you like. That's international UFO researcher and author Philip Mantle. True UFO stories come with a tinge of the bizarre when examining some of the most famous UFO cases in Brazil. Brazil has provided the type of cases Hollywood movie producers would drool over. They are spectacular, dangerous, they're tinged with mystery, and people actually get hurt. Yeah, uh, the Virginia case is a UFO crash in Brazil in 1996, and aliens were uh, rescued by Brazilian militaries and then sent to the United States. Well, uh, the last news that we have is about the one of uh, the soldiers that work at, at Secret Service of the Army in Brazil, and he touched without gloves or without any kind of protection. He touched the creature and uh, he died. Uh, a week later, he got a, a bad, a bad uh, fever and dizzy and nausea, nauseous, and uh, he became, uh, he, he died a week later. And what we know is that only now, years after the case, is that his family got the report of his death. Almost 20 years, almost 30 years after the wow. case, he never got the report of, the, of his death. And he was buried, buried in, a, in a flat uh, coffee, mm -hmm. like a, to prevent uh, radiation or some kind of toxic stuff. And uh, they was buried in, like, in, in something like that. Well, if he, he just died because uh, some kind of infection, normal infection, it w wouldn't be necessary to put in a, in a lead coffee. So it's very strange. And we're still looking for documents. We, we have testimonies of two militaries that participate with the, to participate of the, the rescue of the mm -hmm. UFO and aliens. But they're still alive and they're still in the army and they cannot say nothing. They 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 afraid to say something and something got wrong with get wrong with, with them. Yeah. So what what did the creature look like? What type of alien was it? Well, uh, we, do you have images? Do you have a, a a film or just audio? We have a video or audio? No, we got we got uh, vision. Yep. Oh, okay. So let's show you. The Virginia, the, the aliens is just like this. Wow. Look at okay. Red eyes, uh, big head, skin color, and uh, this tree, you know, horns in, a, in yeah. the head. We don't know yeah. if it's horns or some kind of helmet. And it was very thin and very short. And this one, particularly this one, uh, when it, he was found by three girls, he was like very afraid, he was crouched in, in the ground, so very afraid. Mm -hmm. So that case is still ongoing, they, they haven't determined anything yet? Yeah, the, the, the case is not closed. Well, the army made a report saying that the alien was uh, a person with, uh, with uh, some kind of... Uh, uh, strange face and, and something like that. This, this is what we call it Mujin, like uh, he, he cannot talk. And um, the army report said that what the girl saw was that, was a person. Mm -hmm. But many people saw it, military saw it, and military told us that what they got was not a human at all. That's Brazil UFO researcher and author Thiago Luiz Tachetti. Among other things, he talks about the amazing alien encounter Antonio Vilas Boas had in 1957. His was reportedly the first known case of a human and alien engaging in extracurricular activities. It's coming up on the next episode of Aliens Revealed Live Files. Well, thanks for being with us, and don't forget to check out our site at arlhub.com. That's arlhub.com. And as always, keep looking upwards and take care.